All right. Welcome, everybody, to uh, a wonderful evening with the New York Giants Preservation Society. We have giant royalty here tonight. Uh, Woohoo! Barbara Ochschneider is going to be speaking about her legendary father career, uh, Hall of Fame career with the Giants. Uh, before we get to that, let me just make a few uh, brief announcements on what's going on. Uh, no meeting next week because the Giants will be playing uh, the Mets at City Field. Uh, so the following week, we have uh, Charles Fra Fracchia. Did I, Charles, did I say that right? You got it right. One of the Perfect. few who got, actually got it right. How about that? Uh, Charles, despite us all saying we're the best Giant fan, Charles had a movie written about him called The Adventures of a Superfan. Uh, and it's his uh, quest to get a... Uh, 1978 Giants, um, not yearbook, uh, media guide signed by everybody in the book. Ah. And he succeeded on that, and it should be a really entertaining night. It uh, only took me 35 years. It only took him 35 years. <laughs> uh, tentatively on September 9th, Linda Passetti, Babe Ruth's yeah. granddaughter, will be talking about the great Bambino's time. Uh, playing, yeah, for Giants, uh, playing for the Yankees yeah. in the Polo Grounds. Um, then we got uh, Mike Hauser, who's uh, related to uh, George Burns, who, not the comedian, George Burns oh. was considered to be the Giants' ball uh, best ball player in John McGraw's eyes, yeah. other yeah, than Christy Matthewson. So, and we're going to wind up in September on the 30th with Josh Frager, uh, famous for the Echo in Green, and it'll be Bobby Thompson's, what is it, the 80th anniversary, 70th anniversary of the shot heard around the world. Uh, October will come around. I have guests lined up. No dates, though, because hopefully the Giants will be in the playoffs, and I don't want to take away uh, people from viewing anybody, and I don't want to take you away from your television sets just in case uh, the Giants are, are moving along. So, anyway, um, before Barbara talks, Barbara was very concerned about um, being able to do this, but we did a little practice run on Sunday, and she's raring to go, and you should all be <laughs> proud of her because she's as she would say, not technically savvy with this stuff, but she is here and she is ready to go. Barbara, the floor is yours. Welcome to the New York Giants Preservation Society. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I would like to say bef before I start that uh, I would like to say thank you to all baseball fans in general and Giant fans in particular, because you certainly did give me a very wonderful life. So thank you. Uh, and I thought you probably know a lot of my father's records, probably better than I do, but maybe you don't know how this boy, 16-year-old and then 17-year-old, from Gretna, Louisiana, and if you haven't heard of Gretna, you're among the majority. Most people have never heard of Gretna, Louisiana. Even in Louisiana, they haven't heard of it. It's a little town across the river from New Orleans. And um, he um, play, was playing in high school and he played, my grandfather played in what was sort of called semi-pro. Semi mm -hmm. um, and that the semi-pro part came from, it was just a bunch of working men where they worked and they'd form a team and they'd go play other teams. And um, at the end of the game, they'd pass a hat to pay, collect some money to pay for their expenses. So that was the semi-pro part. Uh, so one summer, and I suppose this was the summer when he was 16, Someone on the team of my grandfather's team couldn't go. I guess he was sick or something. So they took my father along and they got to the game and they asked the other team, is it okay if he plays? Because we're short a guy. And they said, sure. 
So later in the summer, the same thing happened and they took him again and they went to play and ask again, is it okay if he plays? He plays. And they said, yeah, he plays, but we flipped for him. So uh, by that time, it was, he was pretty good. Now, there were no agents at that time. I don't think the word even had been invented. And he played in high school and he did go over to New Orleans and he tried out, he and a friend of his went over and tried out for the New Orleans Pelicans. Well, the manager gave his friend a chance, but he told my father, you're too, too small to play ball, go learn a trade. <laughs> so, so that didn't work out too well. But there was a man in New Orleans, a very wealthy man, Mr. Williams by name. And he, um, how he saw Daddy play, I have no idea where he saw them, whether it was in him, whether it was high school or maybe the few times he played with my grandfather's team. I don't know. But Mr. Williams also was a great big baseball fan. And he and his wife, and his wife happened to be an actress. I don't remember her name, but I, she was before my time, so I'm sure she's before y'all's time. Um, they were going to Europe for the summer. So they left New Orleans and went to New York. Well, Mr. Williams just happened to be a very good friend of Mr. McGraw's, John J. McGraw, that is. And they had lunch together when he was in New York and he told him about that. And so uh, McGraw said, sure, send him up and I'll have a look at him. So Mr. Williams sent sent him a postcard, a penny postcard. That's how much they cost then. <laughs> and he sent that uh, to him to report to McGraw in New York, report to the Giants. So that got this postcard and took one look at it and said, oh, sure, sure. <laughs> and he didn't believe it for a moment. He was certain someone was paying a, playing a trick on him. So he didn't go. Mm. Well, at the end of the summer, Mr. Williams got back and he saw Daddy and said, what are you doing here? Why aren't you in New York? Oh, so now he's 16 years old. There are no airplanes. He's never been out of the city, out of the state of Louisiana. And he's going to New York all by himself with his straw suitcase. I want you to know it's always been with the straw suitcase that he had. And he gets to New York City and takes the subway L to the polo grounds. And he was absolutely positive that he'd never make it because this thing, this train up in the air and it was going around curves and he was sure it was gonna end up on the ground and he would be dead. Yeah. <laughs> it did make it. And so he got to the polo grounds and Mr. McGraw was there and had him hit some balls, I guess. And now he's 16 years old and Mr. And you probably, probably most all of you know that he had a very, uh, un, shall we say, unorthodox batting stance. Yep. Um, looked very much off balance. One described it as turning the other cheek. And he, um, so he started to hit. And McGraw, of course, saw the, the stance. And, and my father was not, a large man, maybe five nine, maybe five ten, maybe five ten, uh, and wasn't wasn't he was stocky, but he wasn't heavy. But Mr. McGraw saw when he batted that even though this was a very strange way of doing it, nobody, no coaches are going to teach kids to bat like that. 
his head never moved. It stayed right on the ball all the time. <laughs> and so he, he saw right away that he had someone, he had someone who could hit and he was gonna keep him right there. Now this was the end of the season. And when he went up, he went up as a catcher. That's what he played in high school. <laughs> But Mr. McGraw noticed his short, stocky legs and his ability to hit and thought he didn't want him to be a catcher because it would shorten the career and his legs would be iffy. So we asked him, have you ever played the outfield? And he answered, yes, sir, when I was a kid. And I was 16 years old. <laughs> and I asked him, did you really say that? And he said, well, he supposed he did because they wouldn't have made it up. It was not the kind of thing they would have made up. Um, and uh, excuse me, but that's somebody will get it. <laughs> okay. So um, he uh, said that, you know, for him, he was quite serious saying that he may have been an outfielder when he was 14, you know, or 13 or something like that. So he really meant it. So it was the end of the season. So he, McGraw said, report to spring training in the spring. I mean, it was the end of the season. So report to spring training in the spring, which, which he did. And, uh, He signed, McGraw said, yes, we're going to sign you up. Well, he couldn't because he was only, he had his 17th birthday in his first spring training. He wasn't old enough to sign the contract. So they had to write to my grandfather. And I think I have a copy somewhere of the little letter. Yes, he has my permission. You have my permission or whatever to sign this contract. So he signed the contract. Uh, and ended up in the polo grounds. And he spent probably most of the first two years sitting on the bench next to Mr. McGraw, who uh, was somewhat, uh, well, he was called the little Napoleon because he was, uh, he told everybody what to do and you, you did it. And so he, every time anyone on the field, be it the visiting team or the Giants, anytime anyone made a mistake, he would turn to my father and say, you dumb Dutchman. Now, excuse me for any Dutchman. It's just the term my father used for any string of language that our delicate little ears were not should not hear. So that's Mr. McGraw's language. It was very colorful, I understand, but it was always dumb Dutchman as far as I know. And he would ball him out for any error, any mistake anyone made. And at the same time, now he's been put in the outfield and he, you know, he played a few times. He was in the outfield, but he was not, he was not speedy because he was stocky, he wasn't long, lanky, but he had a very, very good arm. So Mr. McGraw got one of the track members of the US Olympics team to come and coach him on running so he could run better. And at the same time, during the warmups before the game, batting practice, he would send him out to the outfield and they would hit ball after ball after ball uh, against the polo grounds right field wall, because that's what he was playing. And I'm sure you've all seen pictures of the polo grounds. It does not look like your usual ball field. It goes out, well, it's, it's an oval, it's like a football field, and then straight, straight walls from the foul line on out just the bleachers. 
so the ball would act rather strangely. So he had to, had to do that and learned how to do it. So he would have liked to play in the minors. And as you probably, well, maybe don't know, but way back then from spring training to the beginning of the season, the teams from the end of spring training, they would take trains back up to wherever they were going, New York, Boston, whatever. And on the way, they would stop and play exhibition games with minor league teams. And at one of these stops, one of the managers of the little league team, I mean, the minor league team, came up to Mr. McGraw and said, let me have that kid for a while. And Mr. McGraw said, I'm not going to let any string of language again, minor league manager get his hands on this boy. So Casey Stengel went back to his dunk. And, uh, but the pole grounds, and by the way, anybody who wants to interrupt and ask a question, I will be very happy to, if you do that. Um, and so let's see, back at the polo grounds, which was, was so strange and it was really fun for, for the fans because I don't, I don't know of any other major league team, at least at that time, where the fans after the game could exit off the field. In other words, you could walk from the infield and around the dugouts and all those stands there and exit center field, you know, way back there where Willie Mays made that catch. Um, there, these, a, a runway type thing, trucks could drive through it and they would raise the gates and everybody could exit out that. So you got to walk across uh, the whole field and that was fun. And it was great fun because the, again, another thing that I think was quite different was that um, the clubhouse, clubhouses usually are on, you know, they, you enter the, from, you get to the dugout under the back of the stands and come up into the dugout. Well, not on the polo grounds, the, the locker rooms were up in center field and you had, there were two stairways going up on the right-hand side for the home team, going up the side of the bleachers, and the left-hand side was the visiting team, and they walked up these stairs to get to the locker room. Well, when they took a pitcher out, particularly a pitcher for the opposing team, he had to walk all the way out of the field and up those <laughs> stairs to the great joy of all the fans who would be raising, <laughs> waving their white handkerchiefs and yelling all sorts of things at them. And then he had to walk up the stairs to the uh, locker room and the fans would be hanging over the bleachers, looking down at them and saying, I'm sure all sorts of unkind things. And then the... Um, If a giant pitcher was taken out, of course, he was given much better consideration than was said, it'll be fine next time, wait till next time, next game, you'll do it, da da. And they would encourage him as, encouraged him as best they could. And also, when the uh, teams came out on, came to the dugouts for batting practice, came onto the field, they had to walk all the way from center field to the dugouts. And, um, my father had a, this was one of his uh, superstitions, that if they had won, he would never step on the foul line. If they lost, he would always step on it. So we, of course, when we left the stadium and looked out that way, if we lost, we would jump all over the foul line. If we didn't, if we'd won, we would hop over it. And he would always wave to us as he went by. He wouldn't make a show of it, but he would just put his hand down 
straight his arm straight down on the left side and wave his fingers at us. And that was our special wave. And another odd thing about the polo grounds, I think, and somebody could perhaps tell me um, if this is true, I, th I think it is. The Giants dugout was on the first base side and the visitors were on the third base side. And I have noticed in games as I see them on TV that it's the other way around now. And I don't even remember if it was the other way around or not. Now, if there are any questions, are there any questions? Yeah, Barbara, no. Barbara first of all, uh -huh. your storytelling, uh, just amazing what you remember. And I'm sure there'll be a lot more questions about your dad. Uh -huh. um, just a couple of things in the last week or so. Um, you know, your dad's been mentioned often. You know, Field of Dreams movie was on. Yes. And, you know, uh, Moonlight Graham said, hey, there's Mala. Uh, yesterday or the day before during the Mets game, the Giants have a player, I don't know if you're familiar with him, named Wilma Flores. Now, Wil Wilma Flores used to play for the Mets, and he wore number four. Ah. He plays for I the giant. He plays for the Giants now, and Gary Cohen said, "Well, you can't wear number four because of <laughs> you know your your dad," and he now wears number forty-one for the Giants. Uh, <laughs> Flores. And just lastly, for me, um, growing up, uh, your dad was legendary in my father's eyes because he would always mimic him lifting up his right leg, <laughs> and top yeah. his batting style. My dad was also a southpaw. So it looked very natural to my father, but uh, I'm going to open up the questions now. Uh, we got, well, let, me, uh, let me just say that he he wasn't left-handed. He batted left-handed, but he threw right. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, Gary right. Brown, I think you had something to say. I do. First of all, Barbara, I'd like to thank you for being with us this evening. And I'd just like to share one of my favorite stories about your dad. And it was the day that he hit his 500th home run in August of 1945. And that night he went to Toots Shores for dinner and Toots adored him. He loved all the athletes and the giants in general, but your dad in particular. And the story goes that when your father got there, Toots was sitting with Sir Alexander Fleming to discover a penicillin. <laughs> and the captain came over to Toots and told him your dad was there. He said, well, you have to excuse me, Sir Fleming. Somebody important just walked in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that is a wonderful story yeah. and I, I'm sure dad he didn't hear it because he wasn't there when he said it but he's I'm sure he heard the story Barbara yes I this is not a question mm -hmm. I'm, I'm asking you to move backwards because I snip pictures and I can send you a beautiful picture to you if I get your full face in the picture just a little bit further back no well, a little bit further back I want to get your full face. Gary knows this. I snip pictures and send them to him, and he sends them out. Okay. Am I back uh, yeah, far enough? That, yeah, just, uh, yes, that's perfect. Uh, just stay there a while, and I have no questions for you. Okay. <laughs> Gary, Gary, did you also want to talk about what you might be spearheading, or you want to save that for another? Yeah, if, uh, if I could do a couple of minutes. Sure. Or not even a, a couple of minutes. There's a part of of course, last couple of years ago, they already named the Harlem River Driveway in honor of Willie Mays. And this has been in the back of my mind for about a year or so, in the hopes of trying to get a part of 155th Street named for your father. Oh. I've been trying to get in touch with the people at Community Board 10 and the councilmen in that area. And it's a work in progress, but I hope it's something that be able to come of it. With, and uh, it's something I'd I hope I can get done for you. Well, thank you. That sounds wonderful. Thank you, Gary. We're going to go to Dave Lippin and uh, Mo Resner. Um, well, I'd like to thank you for uh, joining us. And my question is basically, what did your father think of his two managers, uh, <laughs> John McGraw and uh, Bill Terry? You know, I mean, he spent a great deal of time with them. And then he took over the club after uh, Bill, Bill left. So he became a manager himself. So, you know, what did he learn from them and, and take into his managerial career? Well, uh, he learned, 
as as I mentioned, I think he learned so much from Mr. McGraw about baseball. I, I don't think anybody knew baseball any better than, than he did. And he just coached him the whole time. Uh, and Bill Terry, I really don't know. I, he, I don't remember him being mentioned that much. Really? No, it, that's odd, isn't it? Um, but I, I, but you have to realize, uh, by the time I was born, my father had already been in playing for the Giants for nine years. Wow. By the time I was five, he'd been fourteen years. So by the time I begin remembering things, it's probably more when he was manager. So that, but I know, for instance, with uh, his, his style of managing was not much like McGraw's. McGraw was really a tyrant. And it was a very funny thing. Um, my father was up to bat and he got the sign from McGraw to bunt. And there was some, <laughs> obviously some men on base. And he thought, me, bunt? And although I have to say, that thought that any major league player ought to be able to bunt. There's just no excuse for not being able to bunt. Right. It might not be a good bunt, but you should be able to bunt. So he decided he, Mr. McGraw must have been flicking a, a fly off his face or something. He, he didn't mean <laughs> that. So he didn't bunt. He had a home run instead. And Mr. McGraw fined him $100. <laughs> that wasn't the only time he did that. <laughs> and that was a lot of money at the time. Yeah, and he did that a lot when somebody didn't follow instructions. Yep, yeah, you, you did it to had, Jim Thorpe and Jack Red Murray. Yep, yeah, he was he was like that. But I know that managing was completely different from playing, and 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 very difficult because <laughs> the first year that he was managing. He was thrown out more times than he had been in the 18 years he'd been playing all together because he had the whole team to protect and he had to go up and fight for each one of them instead of for himself. So it, uh, it, it took a lot. Thank you, Dave. Uh, before we go any further, I just want to thank uh, Rich Rogers for setting this up. I did not know about Barbara. Uh, Rich, Rich, and uh, Steve Rothschild help. But Rich really spearheaded this, uh, getting me in touch with you, Barbara. So, Rich, I salute you. Uh, I we don't got, know how he. I don't know how he found me either. <laughs> while we're on the subject, Barbara, uh, did, does, did the San Francisco Giants ever reach out to you for, you know, uh, I don't know, like an honorary day or or some kind no. of old timers day or something? No. No, they haven't. But I'm not sure they'd know how to. Well, they know now that we have your number. <laughs> <laughs> they, All right. They, sh they should. They've been negligent. Mo Reisner, you're up. Mo, go ahead. Mo, can you hear me? Hey, Mo. All right. We're passing over Mo. Dan Taylor, you're up. Well, first, Barbara, thanks for doing this. This is a real treat, and your storytelling is wonderful. Uh, Two-part question. Um, in your childhood, did you have a sense of how highly regarded your father was, or, or was he just was he just daddy to you? And and did he bring the game home, or could he shut it out and just enjoy family life? Okay, that we get my sister and I, uh, and she's no longer alive. But you know, people would ask us what it was like to have a famous father and a popular one like that. We never had a different father, so we didn't know any different. However, we did know that he was very famous and we did know all of that sort of thing. But then, you know, we knew the children of the other baseball players too. And so that was kind of no a normal way of being also. And I, I used to play with Carl Hubble's son, Carl Owen. And uh, Carl Owen, uh, Carl Hubble, and, and Daddy were roommates. 
and it was quite normal. And I'll tell you a story, which I had told Rich before, but if you don't mind, Rich, I'm repeating it. Um, <laughs> you can repeat everything you want to, Barbara. <laughs> it's all uh, wonderful. That it was such a normal, considered normal life that I must have been five years old or so. I was old enough to be able to write my name. And one day, Daddy asked Mama, why is Barbie wearing that pencil around her neck on a dirty string? And I want, I want you to know, I do not remember this incident at all, but I have known it all my life because it was part of the family lore and the pencil was always on a dirty string, never just a regular string, but a dirty one. And mother said, I have no idea why she's doing that. Why don't you ask her? So he asked me and I said, well, just in case somebody wanted my autograph, I wanted to make sure I had a pencil so I could sign <laughs> it. And uh, the, the pencil went the way of most things that aren't used and just slowly disappeared. But my story does have a rather happy ending. Many years later, say about 15, 16 years later, he was announcing for the Tigers the Detroit Tigers. And at that time, every year there was an exhibition game. I don't think they do it anymore, but every year there was an exhibition game, one National League team and one American League team. And they played an exhibition game at the Hall of Fame. And this year, the Tigers were playing. So my mother and I drove over to Cooperstown for, for the game and to, to see it. We were in Detroit. And we stayed a couple of days. And so it, it's, I guess you all have probably been there, but it, and I assume the stadium's still there. It was those small little stands, probably no stands in the outfield, probably just around the infield. And uh, after the game, Dad was down talking to reporters or someone. And I just went down and joined him on the field. And there were a bunch of young boys or young men, I guess, up in the stands. And one of them came down to get his autograph. And his friends yelled, and get hers too. And my father turned to me and said, and you don't have your pencil. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of, uh, a, it was normal for us, even though we knew it was different, but everybody's life, you know, Doctors' lives were different. They did different things. And as far as bringing things home, we, we would always talk about the game. Yeah, I remember being taught how to slide on the living room floor in the apartment uh -huh. here that we rented because um, he had developed this way of sliding. I don't know if they, they slide head first so much now. I don't know what they do in it or if they did this sort of, continue to do this sort of thing. But it was unusual enough that he figured out something to do that he had to go tell a few of the umpires what he was doing so that they would look for it. So they would not look at the wrong leg and think he was out when he was safe. So he taught me how to do that in the living room floor. My mother was not amused. No. <laughs> so they did bring, uh, you know, yeah, we talked about it and I always learned the lineups and then I learned to keep score. I was taught by Frankie Frisch how to keep score. Yeah. And um, yeah, does that answer your question? All right. It does, that's wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we, we're gonna go uh, the following order. Rich Rogers, Bill Clank, Mars, George, and Jeff Stewart. Rich, go ahead. Okay, Barbara, thank you so much for uh, joining us. I indeed, this is a pleasure. Uh, I think the group maybe would be interested in 1938 when your dad was voted most popular and he was voted most popular in more than one position. And, and I, I, think, I think the group would be interested in what your dad generously did, uh, which pretty much indicates what kind of guy he was. Uh, when the, the voting was completed. 
okay. Um, he he was a right fielder, and they they were voting one position at a time of the most popular player in the league, and he won it for right field. And the Giants' third baseman got injured, and so Bill Terry asked that if he would mind playing third base for a while. And so he said, no, he'd play third base. So he did. And so when the voting came up for third base, he won that too. And you were awarded an automobile. Each player who had won was given an automobile. And he said, thought it wasn't fair for him to take the second automobile. So he gave it to whoever came in second. Great story. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and also, uh, things that they did at Wheaties used to give a oh, pot yeah. of Wheaties every time for a year or so a play hit a home run. I cannot tell you the number of boxes of Wheaties we had. We, we were given, <laughs> standing on the street corner passing Wheaties out to people. <laughs> How do you keep 20, 30 cartons, not boxes, cartons of Wheaties? Good cereal, but you know, how much can you eat? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bill Clank, you're up. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, lovely comments from a lovely lady. I really do appreciate these. And I will remember the, your closing comments in your original comments. Uh, the story certainly of whether you would touch or not touch the, uh, the foul lines. That's, that is a great story. Um, in 1947, the Giants put out their first yearbook. Many of you have this. Barbara, you may have seen it, and I think many of you have seen it and read it. The, the wonderful thing about this yearbook was the main story, as we would expect, was about Mel Ott. And I'll tell you, there's a, a wonderful photo of him. Uh, as, you I know, have the that only picture people, hanging on the wall right here. You do. You have that one. Wonderful. It's right there on the wall. <laughs> Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to take just a moment and read. There are two paragraphs from this story that encapsulate so much what Melot meant to the Giants. And, and this is the first and the third paragraphs of the story, real quickly. There is, of course, no truth to the legend that Melot was the first child born at the <laughs> Polo Grounds. It only seems that way. Facetiousness aside, Mel made an indelible stamp on the baseball traditions of the Polo Grounds and upon the Giants. When you say Giants, you think of Melot. And when you say Melot, you think of the Giants. Um, Mel was 16 years old when he entered uh, the clubhouse at the Polo Grounds. Legend averse that he wore short pants. Um, <laughs> uh, but Mel insists he was togged out in his best sun Sunday longies, as he called them, <laughs> on that memorable trip from his home in New Orleans. And in the intervening time, he has grown in experience, in stature, and public estimation, as few ball players have. Not many have excelled him on the field, and there are none who have combined more skill with the sincerity and purpose that always characterized his play. I have just about every giant yearbook, and I will tell you, I don't think I've read in any of those yearbooks such a uh, great tribute to a ball player as that one. And of course, this happened to be in the first yearbook, and Barbara. Uh, I, I hope you have it. Uh, if you want a copy of that article, I can arrange through Gary. If you, if you don't have the yearbook, I'll make a copy of the article. I won't make a copy of the picture because you already have it, but the uh, copy of the okay. article. It's a, it's a wonderful article about Mel. Thank, like you Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. Mars, go ahead, Mars. Uh, welcome, me. Barbara. Thanks oh, for joining yeah. us. I got a funny little story for you. In 1951, when I was four years old, uh, my pop uh, took me to Columbia University's baseball field and uh, to show me how to bat left-handed. And he says, raise your leg uh, like Mel Ott, uh, the, uh, who I saw when I was a teenager play. So I raised my leg and I fell right over. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I also I, I'm familiar with Gretna because uh, uh, I knew it as uh, Germantown right across the river 
I spent a lot of time in New Orleans. And did your, uh, I guess, uh, did, did, uh, was your dad around when, uh, to meet Mill Clark, Will Clark? Because he's also from Gretna. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they met, but Will Clark was a lot younger. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, but I was wondering if- um, At Mars, there's no way they could have met. He died so young. Yeah, I, I guess so. I wasn't sure when your, when your dad passed. So I also wanted to ask you, um, did you ever see your dad hit a home run? i sure I did, but I don't remember it. I remember more his, his managing. I just remember he, it was always there, baseball, and he was always on the field and it was always happening. But I don't remember that many specifics because I was, that was a, quite a while ago uh, and I was quite young. So uh, I don't think I remember seeing. I did your dad, I'm sorry. That's did, all. Did your, did your dad's temperament change in the 40s when he was managing? Did, did you find him under a lot of stress when the Giants had losing teams? Um, he was under a lot of stress, but he was... He was always wonderful with us. So, uh, I mean, we were under the stress because we were big Giants fans. So we didn't like them losing either. But I really, yeah, he, he was under stress. It was more difficult. But the but last not question for us. I, the last question I have is: Did you live in Manhattan or did you live in the suburbs the whole time? Neither. We always lived in New Orleans. Ah, and we would, and when school was over, or even before that, when we were very little, mother would pack us in the car, and she would drive us, two little children, no air conditioning, from New Orleans to New York, and oh. although sometimes we took the train, often she would drive us, and Ed would, would uh, sublet an apartment in New York every year. So we lived around in oh. various places. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, we got George Greger, you're up. Thank you, uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, hello, Barbara, it's a pleasure. You are a celebrity. Uh, uh, <laughs> one, one of the highlights of my uh, New York Giant uh, life, I, I did walk through the uh, field, through the gate in center field years ago. Nobody has mentioned this, so I think I will. There, there are three factoids about Melot uh, that haven't, I didn't hear mentioned. Uh, they're actually in my latest book on factoids and interesting fact, uh, first and only is drawn from 150 years of American baseball. In 1946, Melot was the first manager to be ejected from both games in the doubleheader. <laughs> <laughs> 1929, he was the youngest man to hit 40 home runs. 20. And, in, and on the last day of 1929, the Giants played the Phillies. In the first game, Chuck Klein hit a home run. In the second game, the Phillies walked Melot five times to preserve Chuck Klein's home run lead. So those are three things I've dug up during my research writing other books. So uh, those, are, those are great stories and, and he was a great man. I wonder whether he was the person Leo DeRocha referred to when he talked about uh, good guys finishing last. Oh yes, oh yes. That's, That's where crazy. that came from. Yeah, he, okay. Uh, Daddy was managing the Giants and uh, DeRocha of the Dodgers, and they were in the polo grounds. And DeRocha, as you may have heard, did not have a reputation for being the nicest, cheerfulest, most accommodating uh, people. And uh, the reporters before, a lot of the reporters before the game were talking to him and, and he was not help, not being helpful. And they said, why can't you be nice? And he said, nice. See that guy over there, a nicer guy never lived. 
nice guys finish last because the Giants were in last place, the Dodgers were in first. And so that's where that came from, except he didn't, as a matter of fact, he has a, a biography and he starts it off with that story. DeRosha does. Do you think it was DeRosha behind the alleged uh, center field sign stealing in the post bounce? I have no idea if he was behind it. You never, never. No heard idea. It. <clears throat> but I know that when uh, Dad left the managership, he recommended DeRosha to replace him. And he did. <clears throat> okay. Thanks, George. Uh, we're going to go to Jeff Stewart, then Mo Resner, then Dan Levin. Jeff, go ahead. Okay. Hi. Um, Barbara, I'm enjoying this so much. You've just been great. I hope you do hear from the Giants because they'll be glad they made the connection. I have here the stamp. Oh, <laughs> yes. So you want to talk about that or do you? <laughs> well, it was it was very exciting when he uh, I know when he was young, obviously, he wanted to be a, a baseball player, although I might mention he always said he was a better basketball player than a baseball player. And he had been offered scholarships to play basketball, but he, baseball was his love. But um, I mean, I know he dreamed of being a baseball player and all sorts of wonderful things like that, but I don't believe it ever entered his head that he'd end up being on the stamp of his country. I think that would have been, so it was very exciting. Yes, very exciting. Yeah, I have about six of those sheets. Thank you, Barbara, this has been great. Nice to see you. Thanks, Jeff. Mo Resner. How you doing? Barbara, my name is Mo, and uh, I uh, remember Melot playing. I went to the polo grounds maybe three times a week, and in 1943, I, met, I saw him for the first time, and he spent a couple of years later uh, before he quit. But Melot, to me, was, uh, was a big name, and... Uh, I, I just have fond memories of the polo grounds and uh, and it's good to see you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Mo. It's good to see you again. Dan, you're up. Uh, I'd like to echo everybody else. Thank you very much for joining us. I, I'm curious, like when you were hanging around the ballpark when your dad was managing, were there any players that you had a favorite player or two or players that you remember and have stories about? Let's see. Well, I. You meant. I knew he was sure. more of a teammate, but you mentioned Frankie Frisch teaching you how to score. Yeah, well, he was the announcer <laughs> then. He he wasn't playing for the Giants then, yes, but he taught right. me how. And I, of course, Carl Hubble, who was Dad's roommate, and when they traveled, they they roomed together, and <laughs> he was a, a a hero of mine, I'm sure. Uh, I really liked Johnny Mize when he was hitting and, and Cooper and Kerr. Shortstop. Buddy Kerr. Buddy Kerr. Yeah, I wanted to be shortstop for the Giants, but they would never give me a tryout. So. Yeah, well, if you so, knew how to slide, they should have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should have, because I knew how to do the slide. <laughs> Buddy Kerr. Buddy Kerr? Who is he? He played shortstop for the Giants way back right. when. Yeah. He was later a scout for him too. And he was Wasn't traded he to the Boston Braves. The 221 Club in 1948. Willard Marshall, 47. Buddy 47. 47. 47. 47. Barbara, I got, I got a quick question then we're going to go to Bruce Podwell. Um, it sounds like your dad was very, very humble. Now, uh, when he retired, he was the National League home run leader with, I, I think it was 511 home runs. Did he ever mention that? Was he proud of that fact? I mean, you know, he only trailed Babe Ruth, who was in the American League for the all time, but left-handed hitter, National League, not a lot. Uh, I mean, he didn't have, no, he never, I never remember him mentioning it. I remember once, okay, I'll tell you, because he was, he, he, he never tooted his own horn. Right. 
in all honesty, he didn't have to because other people were tooting it for him all the time, but he, he never did. Um, and I remember, and I was little when I asked this, so excuse my bad question, but I asked him once after a game, Do you, are you more excited if you hit a home run or if you win the game? And he was really annoyed. He said, well, the home run doesn't matter, it's winning the game. <laughs> so, so yes. Barbara, there. were you aware that the, the Giants, this is Eddie Logan, um, issued a ring, that 511 ring, and uh, to honor that. Did you get one of those rings? No, I didn't know about it. No, they had a, a ring, a 221 ring when they. Yeah, the that, yeah that could have been it too, but um, my dad wore it till it, he wore it out. My dad was a clubhouse manager. Oh, so oh. Story, the did legend, you? yeah, Eddie Logan. Yes, did he, did he speak double talk? Yes, well, he spoke a lot. He spoke uh, obscene and profane, uh, mostly. But, but uh, was he yeah. the one who so, could speak sort of double talk? I mean, he could chase. Yes, just some, yes. Because in the polo grounds, as you well know, on the outside where the players came out, mm -hmm. there were two stairs, two stairways going up and then a ramp across and then a ramp going in. And there was right. a door there that right. uh, the players came out of. Mm -hmm. And there were two policemen, one at each bottom of the stairs. Right. But those of us who were rather privileged could go up and wait upstairs. And, and I know the crowds would say, who are they? Why do they get to go up? And we would go up and wait. And your father would come out and he'd talk double talk for us. Yes, right. Well, uh, my dad loved your dad. I mean, that he just thought the sun rose and shine. Now, the story he always told me was he was an assistant to, to my grandfather, Fred, who had the clubhouse and, and the Giants clubhouse, I mean, the Yankees clubhouse. So the day your dad came up on the train as a kid, they sent my dad down to Penn Station to get him. Oh, so, I'm so glad to hear somebody came to get him. I never yes. knew how we got there. And they brought him up to, to the polo ground so he wouldn't get lost on the subway. But the story he tells was, your dad had this old fashioned old battered suitcase with a rope around it. <laughs> Made of straw. That's what they always said. It was a straw, straw suitcase. Thing. And Whatever he got the is. biggest kick out of that. And then, uh, you know, Bell went on to be the manager years later. So I told, I, he told me that story a million times. <laughs> oh. Then he picked up Mel off. And oh, oh. Uh, thank you for telling me because I didn't know that. Yes. That's and, great. Uh, you know, to his dying day, my dad says, my favorite, my favorite, Melon, and he just, and he worked for him, you know, the whole time. Yeah. Oh, indeed. Indeed. I remember. Thanks, Eddie. All right, we're going to go to Bruce Podwell and then Rick Swift. Barbara, are you okay? As far yep, as I'm high? okay. Okay, good. Yeah. Hi, Barbara. It's Bruce. I, Bruce. I remember many games uh, going uh, during the war years when your father was playing. And I would have been about five or six. I knew how to score. And so I would write down what was happening. And it was great. I watched your father hit a home run his first time up, his second time up, <laughs> his third time up. <laughs> and then they intentionally walked him. So he never got a chance to hit four in one game. I, I can't know. remember what year it was, but it would have been around 43 or 45, I'm guessing. But in any case, thank you, Barbara, for bringing back memories of your father. It means a lot to me. Thank you for having me. Barbara, before we go to Rick, you know, you were very concerned about the reaction. I, I, think, I think you and your dad speak for themselves with this group. So it's wonderful. <laughs> Rick Swig, you're up. Rick, your volume's not on or something. Rick, we can't hear you. You want me to try to unmute you? Unmute. Unmute, Rick. There we go. Not working, Rick. Anybody else with a question? Uh, Jim. Yeah, I, got, I got one. Judge yeah, Jim, go ahead. Thanks. Barbara, you mentioned uh, that in that spring training when your dad went and uh, signed his first contract. Just wondering if you remember how much that might have been for. 
<laughs> oh, <laughs> not very much. I'm sure it was there. Were, oh, I, I don't. Know. I don't know how much it was, but um, I, I imagine it could be looked up. But I know that during during the years, it was baseball players were well paid, but not that well paid. You know, nothing like they are today. And I remember Mr. McGraw would say, "Do." You, do you have enough cash? You short of cash? And dad would sort of shrug and hand him $10 or $20, and, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So there was some of that, but no, I don't know how much it was. Did he have to work another job on, in the off season or was, was basically uh, enough no, work? No, he didn't. He made enough to live. Yeah. Good to hear. All right. I'm going to go. Uh, Rick, if you ever get your volume back on, just, you know, feel free to, uh, Ask any question you want. We're going to go. I have, to a, question. Next, I have next, a question. Tony, we got yes. to ahead of you, and then you're good to go. We got Greg Prince, Ed Freer, and then Tony. Greg, go ahead. Thanks, Gary. Barbara, thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, obviously, your dad excelled in New York and was revered in New York. Uh, but give it, given, you know, where he came from geographically, uh, you know, how would you describe his feelings about New York? You know, did he reach a, a good comfort level here? Uh, or was it always a little bit of a stranger in a strange land? Uh, I think he was very comfortable in New York. As I said, he, he in that, when he came, they, they called him Master Melvin. That was one of his nicknames. New York sort of embraced him. Uh, and we're always, even in Brooklyn, they were nice to him. Uh, as a matter of fact, we had a not very nice experience once in Brooklyn because my mother was convinced that, and Mr. Logan would be angry with me for saying this, but my mother was convinced that part of my father's contract said he had to clean up the locker room before he left any game because he was always the last one to leave. Uh, so we were in Brooklyn. We all, my mother, my sister and I had gone to the game. And as usual, he was the last one because this contract also, he had to clean up the visitors, lock, their visitors locker room when they were on the road. And when we got out, we didn't, take the car we and there were no cabs around and so there weren't many because every everybody left so there was a bus stop we wandered over the bus stop well not everybody had left there were a bunch of young boy ball fans and they recognized him <laughs> and they came over my sister says she thought they were uh angry. I thought they just wanted to touch him and all of this. Well, you could imagine how terrified he must have been because this is a mob of young boys, men or what, teenagers, whatever. And he has two little girls and his wife there. Fortunately, a taxi cab came around the corner and he got us in the taxi cab. But all these kids got up on the taxi cab too. And the, the driver said, get out, I'm not taking you. And dad said, you better go cause I'm not getting, we're not getting out. So he went around the corner on two wheels and I guess they all went out. So it all ended up pretty well. So I think he felt very comfortable because people were wonderful to him in New York. And I, I, they were wonderful to me. I enjoyed it too, very much. Hey, thank you. All right, we got Ed Freer. Oh, okay, uh, thank you, Gary and, and Barbara too. Uh, Greg kind of asked my question, but uh, I'll go on to a couple of things. My first game in the Polo Grounds in 54, I definitely remember to answer your question, the home team was on the first base side. I'm sure Mr. Logan can correct me if not, but uh, that's where the dugout was. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoyed your story about New York for the Third Avenue L, which of course is long gone in history. And I know you just spoke a story of Brooklyn, 
But is there any other anecdotes from the 40s and 50s of New York City that you remember or your father told you about that was more joyful, perhaps, or some memory spot? Oh, well, we had such such a, a good time. We used to go to Tutsuos for dinner quite often. And uh, we went to, when the team was out of town, mother would take us to all the Broadway shows. So we got to see all, you know, South Pacific and all the wonderful musicals we got Oklahoma. to. Oklahoma. <laughs> and uh, so we had, a, we had a wonderful time. But my feeling is New York was really particularly great, especially in the 40s and the 50s. And I'm glad they enjoyed it. Yeah, and I don't think it, I don't remember it being scary. I know that after time there was a, a lot of violence, but I, I don't remember that. I remember people being very nice to us. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, we had funny, it was some funny stories because, you know, we had Southern accents and uh, mm -hmm. We would ask for, and they did not, <laughs> New Yorkers do not have a Southern accent. And we would ask them a question and the way they would speak did not sound very polite to us, but they always knew the answer and always gave it to us. <laughs> so we always felt very grateful that they could always tell us what bus to take or where to go. And everybody was, anytime you asked a question, people were very nice. New York. Barb, who sang happy birthday to your sister? Oh, her birthday is would be in December. Right, and who who somebody somebody that your dad knew. Oh, saying happy that birthday. story. Oh, yes. Uh, well, this was in New Orleans, and my sister's birthday. She was a great Frank Sinatra fan, and so they were having a party at our house. My parents had a party for her, and so Daddy called up Frank Sinatra and had him sing Happy Birthday to her over the phone. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, and anybody wonders wow. if Mel took to New York, that's the answer right there. there you go. I, I think your dad wow. was very comfortable in New York and very well connected. Yes. Uh, we're going to go to Tony and Andy, Norm, and Harvey, and then we'll see how Barbara is. Yeah. Tony, hi. Ahead. Hi, this is Tony in uh, Valhalla, New York, Barbara. It's been a wonderful evening. Uh, reminiscence about Mel Ott, the great Mel Ott. I was wondering, did he ever? Uh, talk about being in the All-Star Game in the 30s? Not that I remember. And I have to admit, I've never been to an All-Star Game. Uh, because they were never, I guess they weren't at the polo grounds when I was young. I don't remember. Yeah, I remember going to the polo grounds in yeah. the in the 40s. And uh, he was one of our heroes. We uh, caddied uh, one day to get enough money to go to the polo grounds the next day. Well, you know, I think it wasn't very expensive to go to the ball games then, uh, because during the Depression, even the, the stands were quite full because a lot of people are out of work. And I think you could go. I don't know how much it was because we didn't have to pay for our tickets, so I have no idea. Yeah, uh, it's. It, it seemed that the right field, short right field at the polo grounds was made for Mel Ott and also a player you mentioned, Johnny Mize. They had a great stroke out to right field. Well, of course, McGraw taught you how to use, to know the territory and how to use it. And, uh, and, and the Yankees played in the polo grounds for two or three years. And Babe Ruth liked that. Uh, Right. That fence, that short fence too. Now, so the house that Ruth built, they made sure it was a little further out, but they lowered the wall that's very, very high <laughs> down to waist high <laughs> about. So uh, I think they got that idea in the polo grounds. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. Mr. Baumgartner, you're up. Yes. First of all, Barbara, this is just fantastic. One story after the other. <laughs> I knew a lot about your dad, but I know so much more now. And my dad loved him. He was born in 1914. And I guess to close on a light note, if we believe in Shirley MacLaine's theory that we're coming back, uh, maybe your dad, since he loved basketball, can play for another New Orleans Pelicans team. 
<laughs> yeah. Very good. Very good. Andy. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. Before we go to uh, Norm, uh, Rick Swig is having uh, issues with his mic, but Rick, I missed that question. Uh, he wants to know uh, how your father felt about managing in Oakland. Uh, it was very different very different and um, I think he was just happy to be in baseball. He loved it so much. It was his life. And uh, yeah, I, and we got to go to California. Um, I not having the players not knowing as well how to play, I think probably made a difference to him. Uh, but he would adjust to that and try to work with what he has because the manager can only work with what the general manager gets him. And uh, yeah, I, a funny thing happened when we were in California. Um, he and I would listen to ball games and when television came on, we would, we would sometimes watch ball games on televisions together. And when someone would come up to bat, now he did not do this with every batter, you understand, but every now and then he would say during the game, he'd say, oh, he's gonna ground out to third or he's gonna hit a line drive to left center or he's gonna do this or that and the other thing. And it always happened. <laughs> it was never wrong. Now, he didn't do it every batter. And I would marvel at it. He said, well, listen, because so-and-so hits this way and so-and-so pitches this way and he's doing that right now and the team the, has shifted slightly this way so he's going to pitch this to him so that's obviously what's going to happen and it did but when we were in california once i was listening to a game and i don't know whose game it was and it was about the seventh inning and he came in passed through the room and he said you want me to tell you what's going to happen in this game put all that and he went through the next three innings telling me what every player was going to do for three innings and I was floored until he came back laughing and says you'd believe anything it was a rebroadcast of a game <laughs> and I think I think it's pretty impressive though that he remembered what every player had done for three innings so anyway but that's that was what right. I think he did so yeah I think he enjoyed he wanted he was happy to be back in baseball great Norm and then Harvey well I was going to ask that same question for Rick that you just asked so Barbara I'm just going to say thank you very much for just a wonderful evening thank you for having me Harvey go ahead thanks Norm Barbara I, this has been, I don't have the proper adjective. This has been delightful. My father, uh, Mel Ott, your dad, was my father's favorite player. And my father used to mime uh, your dad's lifting of the, the right foot. And my dad didn't fall over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, but I have a question. You, ha you exhibit uh, a, a deep understanding of the game. I wonder if you follow it today, and if so, what you think of this? I see some shaking of the heads, no. But um, Barbara, do you follow the game today? And if so, what do you think of the proliferation of players who do lift their front leg in batting? Huh. Well, I, I follow it somewhat, but I'm still stuck back when there were eight teams in each league. Uh, and players move around so much. And the only games we get, because I'm in Tucson, Arizona, uh, regularly are the Diamondbacks. So we watch them periodically. <laughs> and so, yes, I, f I follow it, but not the way, I mean, when I was young, if, you, if I heard who was pitching and who was batting, I knew what teams were playing and how it would affect the Giants uh, by who won. 
but no, I can't do that anymore. I have trouble remembering which teams are in which league because they move around so much and the, and the players move around so much. Uh, you know, uh, when, when dad played, it was, you were owned by the owners. You could not, uh, you could not leave unless without their permission, you were bought, you were property. And in a way, for the fans, that was nice because you had a team that tended to stay around. And he was never traded, so that was nice. <clears throat> Thank you, Barbara. You're terrific. George Greger, did you want to say something? Yeah, I wanted to mention, I, I don't see Mo, but Mo Reznor <clears throat> attended the last game the Giants played in the Polo Grounds in September mm. 57. He had the presence of mind to bring a home movie camera which went into the attic. Uh, there, are, there are pictures, actually movies, of folks like Hans Lobert, Carl Hubble with uh, Rube Margward, uh, McGraw's uh, widow with Bill Rigney. 50 years after it was taken, with the help of and the encouragement of folks like Perry Barber, who's not with us tonight, uh, that video was turned into a DVD and is now in the Hall of Fame. Also, with, with Gary's yes, help, yes. like. I'd like to get it over to uh, Barbara in Arizona, you know, uh, offline. Uh, Sorry, our phone was just started ringing. My husband just took it out, so if I, I could. Well, there's a DVD that, with Gary's help, I want to send you of the last game at the Polo Grounds. It's not a video of, of action, although he doesn't show Johnny Antonelli throwing the first pitch and Hank Sauer grounding out <clears throat> and Dusty Rhodes swinging. But it's mostly <laughs> mostly videos taken on the field before the game. They let Mo onto the field and he got some very nice cameos of uh, folks like uh, Willie Mays and uh, <laughs> Dami Thomas and Ruben Gomez uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'd like to get that to you. Also a copy of my giant book from Coogan's Bluff to Baseball by the Bay, but I'll talk to Gary offline. Thank you. We will get that out to you. Anybody with any final questions who have not spoken yet? Steve, go ahead. Yeah, you know, some of the stories, I remember when Rich gave me your number, Barbara, we spoke, <laughs> I don't know, about a half an hour. This is going back already a couple of years. When you retold the stories, it, it came to life. You're terrific. I mean, you were in a comfort zone here and guess what, Rich? We're going to try to do this again with my group and surprise if she's comfortable doing a Zoom. And it's not all giant fans, but it'll be very similar. So, Rich, I'll work with you and Barbara. And absolutely. Do something yeah, be, up here in surprise. Be, be glad to help out. All right. From okay. one, uh, before we get to Gary Brown, from one giant uh, legacy to another, Ed, go ahead. Yes, Barbara, I may have missed this, but uh, how, how did your dad get along with uh, Horace Stone on the boss? Oh, uh, they were very good friends. And they, did you uh, know that Horace Stoneham and my dad are in the Cactus League Hall of Fame? And I'm wondering, uh, during spring training, do you, do you remember they came out in 47? And uh, then and to this day are in Arizona. So uh, how did you wind up in Tucson? My husband is a professor, or was a professor, and uh, ended up teaching at the University of Arizona. Oh, well, that's too that's bad since I'm ASU, but that's good. Oh, <laughs> I have two daughters. oh, bad. oh bad news. <laughs> no, really, I have two daughters. My, I, my oldest daughter is a professor of, uh, at uh, U of A. No kidding. In, in nursing, to this in day. Nursing. Really. Yeah. Well, Herbert obviously has been retired for over, for 20 some odd years, so oh, it's... You know, it's yes. we've been out of that, but uh, well, you you're you have a but and I have to admit that our daughter lives in Brooklyn. I'm so ashamed <laughs> to admit that, but really <laughs> <laughs> can't have, can't control everything. All right, we're gonna we're gonna go with Gary Brown and then Renee. You will wrap it up. Gary, go ahead. Thank you, Gary. Thank you Bar again, Barbara. I just had one question to ask. I know back around, uh, around 1953 or 54, your dad left baseball to go uh, become an executive with a, co a construction company or contracting co contract. Engineering, company. I think. Yeah. Did he miss it, the game in those two years? I mean, it'd be oh, 25 years. 
yes, <laughs> he couldn't wait to get back. And, that, and then he started announcing. And he started announcing game of the day, I think, at, at one yeah, point. Yeah, mutual, right. And then ended up with the, the Tigers. Tigers. Van Patrick and the Tigers, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Garrett. Renee, go ahead. I, I really don't have a question. I really want to thank you for this evening. Your storytelling and grace through this whole thing, fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please be a part of this again. Love to hear more about uh, your stories again. Thank you so much. You're very welcome, and thank you Barbara, for having me. Barbara, I got to tell you, really, what a fabulous night. You were sharp as a tack, you know, more <laughs> than us. And uh, again, just like Renee said, I send you out the emails. Feel free to just hop on and join people who loved your dad and love you now. So why don't we all give it up for Barbara? Thanks, Barbara, very much. Thank you all very much. Barbara, and I'm especially proud that you were able to do this. So go. <laughs> and I got on Zoom. <laughs> you did. Wait a minute. All right. Have a great night, world. everybody. We will see you. Night. Thank you. Uh, next meeting will be uh, September 7th. So I will hang out and shut down the room. Be well, everybody.